This will be the sixth message on the lake of fire. I have not even gotten to the lake of fire yet. But this is the sixth message in this section of the series. Tonight, God willing, if we have enough time, we'll look at some of the scriptures that will cover some of what I've been preaching the last two or three messages and how we could go into God's Word and verify what I've been preaching and reading from. There's literally hundreds of passages, verses, both Old and New Testament, that we could go to And now, and now with the new information that I have covered the last few weeks, look at them differently. With a different set of eyes than what we've been told for centuries concerning the eternal damnation of the ones that are not in Christ up to this last age that we are in. There's hundreds, I will not be able to cover even 1% of the verses. I'll be spending the rest of my preaching years just on these verses. But I'll give you a new understanding, hopefully, how to look for, for them yourselves. And when you do come across them, you could be studying something else, but you'll understand exactly, wait a minute, now with that new understanding, I have to look at this differently. And these verses that I'll cover tonight just declare God's verifiable work that we find in the scriptures which declares what Christ did at Calvary and listen closely to save all mankind I want to emphasize the all part of it all mankind he will drag all mankind. Well, that doesn't sound like it's very scriptural. We'll see tonight that it is. Now I want to be part of that first group. The ones that respond to the message of Jesus Christ that he's the one that can save us from going through what the next age will produce through a correction period a punishment period for the ones that don't believe in what Christ did at Calvary for all. Before I go there, I want to continue reading what I've been reading and then we'll look at some verses. If the Greek word aeon or eon and its various forms such as the adjective aeonios is translated in a consistent manner as a time word with beginnings and endings, then all these scriptures would be absolutely true. Now, you would have to be listening to the previous teaching on some of the scriptures that were already covered. If you haven't, I suggest you go back to that teaching. There's about, this is the sixth message, so you have to, there's five other messages prior to this message tonight. Jesus Christ would be de declared the absolute Savior of all mankind. John 12, 32, And if I, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all mankind unto myself. Now, he's quoting John 12, 32, and we've been there before in previous teachings. The word draw there in the Greek is drag. So really what he's saying is, and I'll be 
and if I be lifted up from the earth, will drag all mankind unto myself. These words would all be of a sudden be pure, simple, uncomplicated truth. You see, when the word aeon is consistently translated as time word, with the beginning and end, the doctrine of eternal torment or punishment vanishes from the pages of the Bible. The handful of scriptures such as those similar to Matthew 25, 46 can no longer be used to void Jesus Christ's declaration to the universe that he drew, and here he uses, or dragged all mankind to himself. Eternal punishment will become an age-abiding correction. Not this age that we're in, but the next. And is there a next age? Yes. See, I believe there's a millennial period. I'm not sure it's actually a millennium of a thousand years. We'll look at that. But there is a millennial period. And that's the way it's been titled, so that's what we'll call it. So eternal punishment will become age abiding correction. As the Rotherham Emphasized Bible puts it, Young's literal translation renders it punishment age during, while the concurrent literal translated chast chastening eonian. Over a dozen Bible translations which have been consistent with the translation of aeon, and each of them, the doctrine of eternal torment disappears off their pages. It is vitally important that we perfectly understand that this word aeon, whether God eternally tortures or corrects through the ages, totally changes the very nature of the Father. If eternal punishment is correct in Matthew 25, 46, then his mercy and forgiveness certainly has an end. But if age during correction or something similar is correct, then we have a father who chastens to bring correction, a father who has the ability through time, patience, and a burning or consuming love to bring back all his wayward children. In this instance, this parable such as the shepherd leaving the 99 to find the one lost sheep is in perfect harmony with the age during correction. Present day orthodox theology is more like the good shepherd torturing most and just barely saving a few. Read that again. Present day orthodox theology is more like the good shepherd torturing most not just torching, eternally torching most, and just barely saving a few. We will conform to the image of God we have in our hearts. History tells us Queen Mary, the Catholic Queen of England, burned many Protestants to death because she conformed to the image of God she was taught in Roman Catholicism. Protestants would later in history would do the very same thing. Whether one's God is an eternal tormentor or, or savior of all mankind will ultimately determine how one treats their fellow man. Jesus told us how to treat our enemies in Romans 12, 20, and 21. Let's just go there. Romans 12, 20, and 21. Let's read it for ourselves. I still use the King James Version as a launching point. But I'm working on the rightly divided translation, as I've pointed out not too long ago. Romans 12, 12 20. Therefore, if thy enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in doing so, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Jesus told us how to treat our enemies in Romans 12:21. Do good to your enemies. Will our Father do likewise? Or will he become a hypocrite? No wonder little children are much quicker to jump into the laps of Santa Claus. 
than to feel secure with the knowledge than to feel secure with the knowledge of a loving heavenly father. Little children pick up quickly the message of hellfire evangelists. They can't reconcile a God who may torture them endlessly with a loving father. Neither can I, and neither can correctly translated Bibles. Our concept of God will also determine how close one will get to the true Father. I don't know of too many people who want to snuggle up to a God who is going to torture most of their brothers and sisters, especially if they are not absolutely certain that they themselves will, will one of those who will escape the barbecue pit. It is extremely disappointing to me that while most of the leading selling Bibles have corrected the mistranslations of the word aeon in many places, they are very reluctant to get completely consistent. Why? The doctrine of eternal torment has been the primary instrument of fear used to build most current denominations of Christianity. To admit that they have been wrong on such a central part of Christianity would totally discredit them. The heads of these denominations would strongly protest the introduction of Bibles, which not longer than the man-made, which not longer the man-made doctrine of eternal tournament. They certainly would not recommend them to their members. They would protest against such a Bible that doesn't instill fear. that doesn't mandate the man-made doctrine of eternal tournament, I mean torment. And they definitely would not recommend them to their members. Most Bible publishing companies, whether we like it or not, are profit-making ventures, often very profitable. Those Bibles which are currently published and do not contain the doctrine of eternal torment, such as Young's Literal, Rotherham's Emphasize, or Concordant Literal, are usually accorded no space in Christian bookstores. They must be special ordered. The big publishers like Nelson will not print totally consistent Bibles until they feel the denominational structures will not come against them. Until then, the leading selling Bibles with the most money behind them will continue to give us clear errors and embarrassing contradictions. What a shame. Something as important as this is being denied, folks. No, I'm not saying that this would lead to, okay, well, if I don't make it the first time around, God eventually will get to me and He'll correct me, He'll punish me, but I'll eventually have life eternal. Yeah, I told you, you don't want to be part of that second group. Even though He will reconcile all, He will drag all, that second group will not have all the benefits will not be able to share in all the inexhaustible rewards. And then will not be able to rule and reign all the promises that are made for those who are in Christ and the first go around. That's the group you want to be in. Not the second cut. Kind of a bad analogy, but you don't want to be on the JV team. You want to make varsity. Well, let's just stop it right there for now. And let's look at some of the verses. That kind of, not kind of, that does mention that all will be reconciled. All will be dragged to God. And all that the Father gave Jesus will not be lost. So let's look at some scriptures. And like I said, there's literally hundreds and hundreds of scriptures, both Old and New Testament, that you can make it a lifetime study and 
can search them all out and piece it all together and it still will probably not be covering every possible verifiable reference to what Christ has done for all. But let's go to 1 Timothy. New Testament. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. Let's just start with there. How does that read? Start with verse 4, it reads, Who will have all men to be saved? And to come unto the knowledge of the truth. You'll see this in some of the verses I will cover tonight. But throughout the scriptures, you'll see this all men over and over again. It doesn't say here, who will have some men to be saved. It says, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Sooner or later, you have to be dragged to that point. You will come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. <coughs> the salvation of all will be testified in due time, is what the scripture is saying. read it again, who gave himself a ransom, which he did, for all, here we, got it. here we go again, for all, verse 4, who will have all men, verse 6, who gave himself a ransom for all, to be testified in due time. I believe in the next age, after this age has come to the conclusion of that time period all will be testifying the testimony of Jesus Christ and what he did for all now let's move on let's go to 1st John Chapter 4. Let's just start with verse 14. And we have seen and do testify in 4.14 and we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of some no translation reads that by the way it reads to be the Savior of the world whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God God dwells in him and he in God. You can avoid what's going to happen in the next age. The ones that don't believe in Jesus Christ by being a believer in Jesus Christ and what he's done for you, which has saved you once you put your trust and confidence in him and what he did for you.
Verse 17, Here is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. <coughs> See, the day of judgment's coming. And the ones that have put their trust and confidence in Jesus Christ, far as their salvation is concerned, won't have to be concerned about that day of judgment. They'll, now, everyone's going to be judged. You have the white throne judgment, the judgment seat of Christ. Two different things. The ones that are at the seat of the judgment, the beam of seat, the judgment seat of Christ, don't worry, have to worry about their salvation. That is secure. There'll be other things that you'll be judged on, but that not salvation is not part of it. The ones that don't put their trust in confidence in Jesus Christ has that white throne judgment to go through. And those are the ones that will receive judgment. And after that judgment, there'll be a punishment. There'll be a correction. How long that correction will be, I believe will be different for... Di not, every, not every punishment or correction is going to be the same length of time. That's why I think you need a whole millennium, whatever that is. And I'll get to these things. I'm just laying out some introductory stuff tonight. Let's go down and move on to another verse. Let's go to, well, we talked about John 12.32. Let's just go to John 12.32 and read it for ourselves again. It reads, And I, if I be lifted from the earth, will draw literally to drag all men unto me. Christ is saying there, what he would go through for mankind gives him the right, and no one can take that away from him, to drag all men Actually, men is not even in the original. All, I believe, both earthly beings, human beings, and also heavenly beings that fell. And I, if I be lifted from the earth, will drag all unto me. <clears throat> That's John 12.32. Let's go to some of my favorite passages on this particular topic. Philippians. Go to Philippians chapter 2. Let's look at verse 9. Wherefore God also had highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name. We're talking about Jesus here. Verse 10, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. There is going to come a day when things in heaven, on earth, and under the earth will all bow. Will all bow. And here's the thing, you know, you read right through these passages, and it took me years to come to this understanding what I've been sharing with you. Years and years. Because I mentioned it years ago, I wanted to get to it. but I was waiting for a certain section of the last day series where I wanted to place this particular topic in and now we're there. So we're, we're looking at it. And we'll be here, I was hoping for anywhere from 12 to 20 messages. I'm, not, I'm still going to try to get it into at least 20 messages, but we'll see. There's too, just too much to cover. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in the earth and things on the earth. Verse 11. 
and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It doesn't say that just Christians are going to bow. It says every knee should bow. And it says every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Anything that can express vocally is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Part of being that glory of God the Father is what Jesus went through as a willing servant in a tenth of human flesh coming down from the heavens as he said he would all the way back in Genesis to redeem man and not just man to redeem the cosmos every tongue now how could every tongue confess and see this is where let's go, let's go to it first Corinthians 12 ties in first Corinthians 12 chapter 3 let's look at it because not there's a certain type of something that needs to happen for you to confess or profess that the Lord Jesus Christ is who he is Here we go. Verse 3. Chapter, verse Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3. It reads, Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus a curse, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Spirit be better. Translation, but by the Holy Spirit. What is that saying? We just read that every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord, and no one can do that apart from the Holy Spirit. Well, how can all do that? Well, all won't do that in this age. But about when, but when the next age is done with, all will bow their knee and all will confess. And after their correction, after their punishment, I believe they also will be gifted with the Holy Spirit because that no man can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Spirit. So sometime in that future, after whatever that person's correction time will be in that age lasting period of time they'll come they'll bow down and they will be drawn or dragged in that case not only to, con to bow down to the Lord Jesus Christ but confess that he is Lord that he is Lord I mean there's no other way there's no other way that every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord apart from the Holy Spirit was this verse is saying so even for those ones that have to go, go through that age punishment period will be benefited with the Holy Spirit I believe when they're through with their punishment
Because that's the only way. I find the scriptures that a man, woman, or anything else will confess that Jesus is Lord. And the only way that happens is by the Holy Spirit. Now I know this is so radical in this viewpoint. But we have to rewrite the scriptures. We have to take all men out. We have to take that everyone shall bow. If it was not to be meant for everyone, why wasn't scriptures a little bit more clear on the matter? That could have been easily done. You know, a lot of Christians talk about the millennium. Millennium, But you really ask them. Ask them. I challenge you. Ask a Christian. Well, what's the millennium going to be like? What about all the people that are going to be alive? And there's going to be billions when he returns. What happens to all those people? Do they have to be immediately put to death and put to punishment? There's a lot of unanswered questions, my friend. And you can't shut your minds up. You have to leave that door open to keep absorbing information. Most of it you get to throw out because it doesn't really verify with the Word of God and what it's saying. A lot of it's silly theories. I'm not telling you I know 100% for sure that this is exactly the way it's going to go down. All I do know is everywhere I turn, I'm just giving you a few out of the hundreds of scriptures in the Bible that keeps declaring all. And that's the point I'm trying to make tonight. It keeps declaring all. All men. Not just some men. Not just a few chosen men. But all men. Okay, let's go to let's let's go to John. We got a we got some time for a few more. Let's go to John, chapter six. <clears throat> Verse thirty nine. You've heard this verse so many different times. Verse 39. And this is the Father's will which has sent me. Okay, what is it? That all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at that last day. What last day? You ever ask yourself what last day that's referring to? It goes on to say, And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth have trust and confidence in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at that last day. Which last day? Sometimes things that are prophesied for the future have multiple applications, by the way. We've seen that in our studies in the last day series over and over. And we'll see some more of them in the future. What last day? Or is there multiple applications here? Is it a last day when he returns? Is it a last day after a millennium? What, what's the last day? These are all questions that people should look into. What is Jesus referring to here? Or does it have multiple applications referring to several things? several periods of time. 
Now, <clears throat> where else should we go? One thing we do know in this verse, that he will lose nothing. That God has given him. And we also know in John 3.16, God so loveth the world, the cosmos, that he sent his only begotten son. And as I said before, he doesn't say God so loved some, of the, some that are in the world. No, God so loved the world, the cosmos. Could that be another reference of all? We've got time for one more. Let's go to 1 Timothy again. Chapter 4. Verse 9. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men. And there's something peculiar here. Okay, I think you get the idea here that I keep repeating, of all men, of all men. That's the whole point I wanted to make tonight. But then it goes on to say, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe? Now what in the heck does that mean? Especially of those that believe. Yes, He's the Savior of the world. Yes, he's the savior of all men, but especially of those that believe. So is this another category of those that don't believe? Those that deny that he is what he is and what he came to do? How else would you look at it? Paul saying, yes, especially of us that do believe in Jesus Christ as the Savior of the world. But, if the, but the ones that don't, he's still the Savior of men. But they're going to be treated differently. They're going to be dealt differently. They will be dragged eventually to bend their knee. And gone through the correction to now be able to finally come to an understanding yes, Jesus is Lord. Fill me with your spirit and let me com commune and have life eternal with Him. I know some are saying, well, it just isn't fair. We as Christians have to go through what we go through. Really? You should count it joy that your eyes have been opened, you responded, and you're communing with Him. He is in you and you are in Him. No greater joy, no greater opportunity. could ever present itself. Christ is it, my friend. And you don't want to miss him this first go around. But my point that I keep trying to make, and hopefully you're getting it, 
all eventually we reconciled back to the Father through Christ. Unfortunately, most will probably have to go through that age lasting correction. I believe through the, through the millennium. And the ones that don't are the ones that have been saved by grace. Having a change of mind in this age and spared what's coming at the next. You have to remember in the scriptures when you get towards the end of the book of Revelation it is only then at the that last day there were no more tears and sorrow. Which implies through the millennium those things will still exist. Why? For the saints of God that responded in this age? I don't believe so. I think is for the ones that didn't respond. There's a lot to cover. He promised he would take away the sin of the world and that's what he did. But those that don't respond to him will still have to be reckoned with. That's Christ's business, not ours. Our commission is to save as many as we can now. Not that we can save them, but we give them the message of who can, and that is Jesus Christ. That's what we're concerned with. I'm not concerned about who's going to wind up in hell or the lake of fire. I wish no one would wind up there. I know that's not possible, but I'm going to do as best as I can to turn on lights so a few more can avoid that coming age-lasting correction and punishment. That was, that was what my commission is. I think that's what everyone should be involved in in the capacity that God's called you in. We are in a rescue mission, my friend, and we have the tools to go out there and wage war against an unbelieving world that is lost. And I told you before, one of my definitions of love is, is give the world what they need, not what they want. They don't want Jesus, but they need Jesus. When Jesus came to die for this world, the world didn't want him. But he knew what they needed. And they needed him. And he delivered. And if he delivered, he has also commissioned us to deliver the message of what he's done. For all. Why did Jesus go preach to the angels, fallen angels that are in Tartutus in the prisons of hell, a certain section of it. What was the purpose of that? If they're destined to be burned in a lake of fire, why preach them? Their punishments already began and then they're going to finish it off in a lake of fire. There must have been a reason for it or else Jesus was wasting his time. Many of you Christians out there need to open your heart and recognize how merciful our Lord is. I've met people in my lifetime, well, I'll never share the good news of the, of the gospel with that, those, those people or that person or whatever. They don't deserve it or they don't seemed to me that every response, why, why, why waste my time? Well, you know what? That's not for you to determine or me to determine. We just keep delivering. We just keep delivering. I repeat, we just keep delivering the message, the good news of Jesus Christ, and let, let God sort all that out. Let's not forget 
by delivering the message how we are accumulating the eternal rewards that come along with it that God has promised us for our faithfulness. Now, I'll pick it up again, but I just wanted to drive home the point that the church world has been delivering this message through fear to produce converts. I rather through grace and mercy keep preaching Jesus. If people don't respond, well that's going to be God's problem during the next age. You ever stop to think about it? And I got a vivid imagination. That those ones that are being going to be punished. You ever think there's a possibility that God will use us to still deliver the word during their correction period? If Christ went down to the pit of hell in a private place for fallen angels, why would he use his ambassadors? And there's going to be a lot of people that are going to need to still hear the good news of Jesus Christ, but now we'll have a different viewpoint about it. Because their eyes will be opened. Don't box God in is what I'm trying to say. Jesus will lose nothing. The salvation of all will be testified in due time. And he will draw or drag all mankind to himself. Why? Because he took away the sin of the world. My friend, he is the savior of the world. It's better to respond in this age for many reasons. But whether you like it or not, you will respond. Now I want to hear from you. Play a song. <laughs>